alaikum. Good afternoon. <laughs> and thank you for this amazing uh, welcome. Uh, you just humbled me even more, so thank you. Um, I believe I should be sitting there and you should be standing and teaching me a little bit about sciences because you're supposed to be the smart ones and we're nothing but restaurateurs. So uh, I'll try my best, but at the end, please feel free to ask any question uh, that will be out of benefit, except how much you sell and what's the secret mix of our garlic, okay? <laughs> Those questions I won't answer, believe you me. All right, uh, I'm going to start with a little story about the real person behind the bake. Uh, my late father, Shakur Abu Ghazala, who had a life of struggle from day one. He grew up in Java, Palestine, where in 1948 he lost his homeland after fighting for it and failing. And uh, after that, he decided to immigrate to Saudi Arabia. So he went after losing everything, he went to Aramco and uh, he started working there. After that, he went into another company called the Railway, in, the Railway Company in uh, the Eastern Province. And after spending 13 years, he decided it's time to provide his kids the best of education. So he went back to Lebanon, where we grew up. I would say he's a true entrepreneur for a simple reason. During the span of the 10 years he spent in Lebanon, he tried more than 10 businesses, succeeded in some, failed in some, but he never knew about surrender. In 1966, he woke up one day to discover that everything he owned was gone. And the reason he had all his money in a bank that went bankrupt. But that didn't stop him. He started again and he stood up and he kept struggling. In 1973, he found that with the oil boom, there was a real opportunity here in Saudi, where a lot of expatriates were coming in and they needed good food, food that is affordable, food that they can trust. And uh, so he came back to Jeddah. He scanned all over the world for ideas and he found in a little town in Wisconsin, a concept called the Brewster Company, where they're not a franchise, they give agencies, where they sell fryers and secret mixes. So he got the agency for Saudi Arabia, and it was the beginning of a word called Brost for the Arab speakers. Uh, that's when it was brought in to the country and it became now one of the colloquial words here. He did something. He spent all his uh, money that he had left into one restaurant I don't know how many people know Jeddah, but it's on the intersection of Medina Road and Shara Flostein. He spent everything on it, decorated it, fixed it. It was the end of Jeddah at that time. Only to find out two weeks before opening 
that there, were, there, uh, there was no electricity and that it was going to take two more years until electricity is brought to that building. So again, one more challenge, one more struggle for him. That didn't stop him. He, he owned a small warehouse near the old airport. So he went, spent a little money, and started the business there. Unfortunately, at that time, not many people knew what fried chicken is all about. They knew the uh, broiler chicken. They didn't know fried chicken. So he would try his best to explain to people how to do it, how, what it is about. He had to learn how to prepare the chicken, how to fry the chicken, how to sell the chicken. He was standing there until 12 at night every day. I remember times when he comes back home very frustrated, smelling of oil, and there were no customers, and he couldn't figure out why. What happened after, in uh, 1975, he found out, he was 47 years old, he found out he had cancer, lung cancer. And after one year, he passed away. One week before he passed away, a phone call came. I was in the hospital. I remember that very well. Somebody called him and told him the Medina Road restaurant opened and we have lines 100 meters out of the restaurant for customers waiting to be served. At least he knew that his last idea was a great idea. So, one of the lessons he always taught us was, if you want to be successful, you've got to know the business you're in, inside out. You better not be shy to get your hands dirty. You've got to ask questions. You've got to dig in. You've got to find out the secrets behind every single part of the business. And that's why he never shied when it took him to be standing himself and selling and serving and preparing the chicken. So, we were in school still, my brother and myself, and uh, one week into his demise, we get a letter from the U.S. company telling us that the agency has been lost. With the demise of our father, you know, the contract or the agreement is annulled, and so you have nothing. You're on your own. We were still in school. We accumulated over seven million reals in losses in the next three years. And uh, when we came back, we had a fact that we had to realize. My brother and I are both engineers. We just graduated, zero business experience, zero experience at work. And we had to face a reality. A bank called us one week into coming back into Jeddah. And they invited us to come and visit them. And they told us that the loan has to be paid up within two years or else we lose whatever our father left us. We had the choice of two. Either we call it quits and say, let's stick to our engineering or we fight it out. And that was the only thing left for us from our father. So we decided to fight it, to prove it, and to keep it alive. 
And that's what we did. And that was the beginning of realizing some of our values. That uh, we have got to work very hard and we better not surrender to challenges. We've got to keep attention to detail as our highest value. And we should never be satisfied with the results. Until today, we celebrate for five minutes and any achievement, and then we go back to work, and we put harder goals for us to achieve. And always the experience of starting your business life, minus seven million reals, has given us this beautiful uh, value of always being hum humble, thankful to God Almighty for protecting us and for helping us go through the challenges that we have. So, our first goal was to pay up the loan. We sold everything that we had, any real estate, any houses, whatever. And uh, the rest of it, we paid it back in less than one year. What we did was we went and learned the financial side of the business. We moved into a very short office where we had to bend every time we entered. We stopped tea and coffee, just to give you an example. Nothing that touches a customer. Anything that the customer does not experience or feel or see, we canceled just so that we can become efficient and be able to survive. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> Our second goal was to learn the business. What is fried chicken business? What is the restaurant business? I mean, I used I worked for three months with them in the restaurant. In the university, I worked in the cafeteria, cleaned some dishes, mopped floors, but that was it. No experience whatsoever on how to build a restaurant business. And the, it, there was a fact that we understood very well. If we don't have that knowledge, the know-how, if we depended on others for secret mixes or for systems or what have you, we'll never succeed. So we took it upon ourselves to go and learn. My brother, he went to Paris, he studied food technology, and I spent a good time in the restaurants. I wore the team member uniform, I went and learned from the team how to mop, how to clean bathrooms, how to cook, how to serve, and how to smile. And this is one of the lessons that we learned, that we should never hesitate who we learn from. It's not Aib. Aib is for you to hesitate to say, no, I'm not going to learn from this person. Aib is not to go and attempt to be your best, no matter where you get the information from. And this is the, uh, one of the things that we did, which is we put our ego in the closet at home, and we rolled up our sleeves, listened, watched, practiced, and asked as many questions as possible from our team members. By doing that, we learned two very important lessons. That our frontline staff are the most important people in any organization. Customers don't know me. They don't care about me as a person. But they know the guy who smiles at them, 
who serves them fast, and when they ask for extra garlic, he says, yes, sir, and he provides it with a smile. They are a bake in the eyes of the customers. So the lesson learned here is that we better take care of them. We better appreciate them, and we better build them and let them understand that they are the true owners of the brand. The other lesson that we learned was that we cannot manage from behind desks. It doesn't work. You want to succeed, you better be there in the field with your customers, with your team members, listening, smelling, feeling, touching, whatever it takes to understand what makes that customer click. And don't forget to be with your competitors also. You better understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, and try to beat it at them. One of the funny stories that I always like to uh, tell about is uh, when once I was in the airport, there were long lines in Jeddah airport, and uh, the passport guy pointed at me and said, come. So I said, yes, I'm gonna, he's going to, he knows who I am and he's going to let me pass. <laughs> so I started to walk towards him. And he said, no, no, the guy ahead. And I looked, and he was one of our team members. <laughs> he was traveling to India, and the guy just wanted to take care of him. So when it was my turn, I went and I asked the guy, I said, why did you let him go first? He said, oh, he's al <laughs> <laughs> He said, uh, every time I come to the restaurant, this guy takes care of me. He gives me the extra garlic and extra bread. And, and this is the least I can do with him. So this is just to a little insight of how important these team members are for the brand. They are the brand. I remember another uh, somebody on Twitter Two weeks ago or a month ago, he wrote and he said, since I was eight years old, there is this guy in Rauda branch. His name is Ernesto Hayada. He's been serving me and taking care of me. So I wish I can thank him back. He's now like 23 or 24 years old. So I told him, don't worry about it. I'm going to go myself and thank you, thank him for you. And I did that night. And two customers from Twitter caught me there, took pictures, and... <laughs> Our third goal was to apply what we have learned. And that becomes now the more difficult part. The learning is easy. Applying what you learned is one of the most difficult things you can do. Because everything that is theory, when it comes to reality, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with different resources, different situations, and you've got to be ready for such challenges. So my brother, Hassan, he uh, developed the first secret recipe for al -Bake. We knew we cannot expand. If we're going to keep importing from abroad. We had to know the business. Luckily, there were no competition at that time. It was mid-80s. There were no international chains, and people would accept anything at that time. So I remember the first time we served our homemade secret recipe for al -Bake. The chicken was black. <laughs> I looked at Hassan and I said, oops, we're going to lose our business. It didn't take us long to fix it, but trust me, we cannot do such mistakes. We cannot experiment on customers these days. 
So we were lucky back then to be able to experiment and learn. He built his first factory, first food processing factory. Today we have uh, a 30,000 square food processing factory in the industrial city, a state of the art factory, where with the push of a button, our secret recipes get fixed, uh, get uh, prepared. Back then, we spent three years, himself and me, going every night to a secret location where we would carry all the recipes, mix them in a batch mixer. Whoever is a civil engineer here, they know what a batch mixer is. And we would pack them back again and carry them to the factory, all for the sake of secrecy. We didn't want anybody to know what this secret recipe is. Whereas today, from his office, he can just push a button and everything is done. Myself, I redesigned all the restaurants. We had to differentiate ourselves from the pack. At that time, there were more than 400 restaurants called Brost in Jeddah alone. So we were just another Brost restaurant. So we had to become different. We went and changed the name to Albeg, and uh, we changed the decoration, we changed the packaging, we changed the uniforms, we worked real hard on the brand, and we made sure that we keep prices the same. We wanted to send a strong message to all customers that you can enjoy more without paying more. And we kept our prices the same for 25 years after. And uh, some lessons that we got from there is that you cannot run a successful business without having clear standards, processes, and procedures. And you better keep improving these systems. You cannot just say, aha, I have a manual. You've got to keep developing and improving these systems. And how? I learned it the hard way. I spent about 10 years of my life, every single night, writing systems. Everything from how to fry, to how to clean, to how to serve, how to open a restaurant, how to choose a location, and so on and so forth. 2,000 pages. Only to discover after those 10 years, that that manual was useless for a simple reason. I wrote it, not the end user. I had to satisfy my ego by writing an amazing manual. But the people, the end users, could not connect with it. So the lesson was, you better let them be involved in writing whatever systems or processes they're going to follow. Do not think that you're smarter than them. They are the end user. They need to use something they understand. And they know more than you in the business or in the work that they do day in, day out. Another lesson, you cannot succeed at al Bayk if you have not grown from the field up. It's a rule. No matter who you are, no matter what qualification you have, if you want to be part of the al Bayk team, you're going to have to go and serve three months in the restaurant, either serving customers or serving people who are serving customers. The reason, we want you to get the values. We want you to understand the real business, the spirit behind everything that ticks. And you cannot do it just by coming in from outside and trying to manage our team. And moreover, 
you will understand the specifics of the business so that you can manage and lead later on with the full understanding what the real business is. Some of the more values that we've learned along the way was, and that's maybe a bombshell for some of you, never work for money. Money is an end result. It is not the reason that you work. You better be working to improve a lifestyle, a way of life of people, of making a society better. Do not think that money is the reason that you're learning and you're studying and you're working for. Because when you do, it's just a piece of paper. Learn how to make the money. Learn to plant smiles on people's faces. And through that, you will make money. Another uh, work to excel, no shortcuts. Work to develop new ideas to improve life. Always think long term. What comes fast will go fast. Do not ever think you are smarter than your customers. We've got ears everywhere. We, the best ideas that we do come from our both internal customers, our team members, and from external customers, the real customers. Sandwiches shrimps, uh, burgers, what have you. These are ideas that they write us. We get over 100,000 requests every year. We make sure that we answer back every single one of them within 48 hours. And we listen very hard. We track everything. We question everything. We sit in focus groups with customers on a routine basis just to listen. Because the more you listen, the more you understand. The more you understand, the more you can create what they want. Uh, then we had to face the a new era, which is the post first second Gulf War, the 1990s where we knew that there was going to be an influx of foreign competition coming in, the best of the best. They've got the standards, they've got world-class systems, they've got the know-how, and they're going to come in and they're going to take over. So we had the choice of two. Either we go and expand before them and be in Riyadh, be in the eastern province, be everywhere and create a market there before they come in, or we consolidate, stay where we are, learn from them what makes them successful, strengthen ourselves, and then start to expand. And that's what we did. We decided not to expand until today, um, but uh, this is the lesson that we learned. We, we learned to know and respect our competition. No matter who they are, they've got strengths and weaknesses. We've got to always understand how they think, their resources, their priorities. Never undermine them. We've got to always respect them for what they do. I'm going to talk as a last slide because I'd like to leave uh, as much time as possible for questions about our social responsibility part. Where out of our thankfulness, our appreciation for the trust that the, our customers has, have given us. We knew that we had to give back. We had to not just provide good food at good prices. We had to really be more active in the community. And uh, we strongly believe that companies who always take and never give back 
things of value to society will never succeed. Whether it is an individual who volunteers some of his time or a company that gives back to the community, I think it is one of the most satisfying experiences any of us can have. And we concentrated on two main concepts. We understood that for Saudi Arabia to succeed, our future generations had to have a different way of education where they can ask the hows and the whys and not the whats, whens and whos. And that's where we worked very hard on different programs to instill that to as many people as possible. The other thing that we concentrated on was the environment and anti-littering in particular. I remember what made us go through that is I used to, long time ago, uh, uh, jog on the Corniche early morning and for fun. It's boring, it's hot, so for fun I would count how many big bags people left on the Corniche <laughs> sidewalks every night because the uh, trash companies did not pick them up that early in the morning. So I would, that was my research, okay, to find out how many Elbeek bags versus X, Y, and Z of the competition. Until one day it clicked. I said, wait a minute, we're really responsible for trashing the place. And that's where we committed to anti-littering, trying to organize as many campaigns, as many educational programs to help people understand the issues of littering and what it does to the environment. Uh, one of the best programs that today we're working on is we collaborated with the Education Minister, Ministry of Education and we developed for them a system for teaching kids from one elementary to sixth elementary how to clean their classes the last 15 minutes of every day. Sounds simple. We, it was very difficult. We had to develop the systems. That was the easy part. The difficult part was to change a culture. Parents stood and said, you're teaching our kids to be uh, service boys? You're, the teachers refused to do it at the beginning. We had to work very closely. We had to uh, ease it in. Parents started to see a change in the attitudes of these kids. Grades started to go up higher. The absenteeism because of illness started to go down. And that's when people, schools started to buy in the program. And what we're doing here is that we're working with kids at a small age, as a, at a young age, to teach them the habits way before trying to teach them when it's too late. Because when you start young, you always get them to do the right thing. Um, I think we're done here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer Abu Ghazala, for your inspiring lecture and great experiences. And now I will open the floor for questions and comments. Please, what you have Make them up, top, have. please. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, just... please. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I have a comment and two questions. Mark. Please.
Sure. Thank you. Uh, smell has all, you see, we don't advertise. <laughs> Our advertising usually is uh, directed towards uh, social work. And when you don't advertise, you've got to reach to the senses of people. When we design a restaurant, we make sure that the exhaust is right at the street so that we can get you while you're driving. Okay? <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, if you, I don't know how people are taking this, uh, these products because I'm sure when they reach, they reach with a lousy quality. And if you try to seal them up more, it's going to get lousier. So the solution is to go and open them. I think it's a better way than trying to seal off the box more. Uh, why we're not open until now or are we planning to? Of course we are. Uh, as I was telling the gentleman at lunch, we get franchise requests from Japan to Brazil inclusive every day. It's incredible, alhamdulillah, how many people are interested to take our business and expand it in their markets. But we have a responsibility here. We should never look at economic gain that is not built in the, uh, solidly. And for us to be able to start to expand, it's not just systems. You've got to have the right people. And in the Middle East today, when you talk franchising, you've got a truckload of people, managers, who understand the franchisee side of the business. You cannot find people who know the franchisor side. So we took it upon ourselves for the past eight years to get young engineers and take them through the whole process from trying to managing to writing processes to developing systems and so on. And they are our future. They are the ones who are going to take us slowly. We're not going to jump to Japan. Okay? But I promise you, we're going to be in Riyadh in this decade. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I told the gentleman here about what our vision is. I'd like to repeat. To me, it explains where we're going. It's putting mmms and wows on people's lips every time, everywhere, the world over. So our commitment is to serve the world, but we better serve it the right way, where every time you take a first bite, I want that mmm on your lips. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? He asked yeah. first. Thank you. I'll, we'll come back. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your presentation. You. And then uh, we are really proud to see like some Arabic like company Al Bayt like against competing against other yeah. Burger King and like other foreigners. X Y Z. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, you said. Uh, uh, I, I was talking about my friend, like in old days, like uh, our father's uh, generation, they had a like, good uh, chance to build businesses. Unlike nowadays, you know, nowadays, like it's full of capitalities, capitalis, uh, ca capitalism and other like competing companies coming from outside. Now, do you think if Rami Abu Ghazala was one of us, like in our generation, would really be successful guy and open a big it's like I, nowadays. I, I tell you something. There are so many opportunities around. You've got to look for them, dig in, understand the business. For example, today, and I'm not uh, trying to market an idea here, but Al Bayk has a serious problem of crowds. 
Okay? One of the ways to break down these crowds is to start a home delivery business. Why don't you come and approach us with a whole concept of how to do a home delivery service? And you can start your own business. We'll support you financially, whatever it takes. You give us your brain abilities and your heart and soul. And we give you the opportunity to take the business and run with it. So what I'm trying to say here is that the opportunities are there. I'm not interested to start a home delivery service. Okay? Why don't you take it? And then you can create your own opportunity. So look for these ideas. Talk to people, talk to customers, talk to corporations. I'm sure more and more companies need self-supporting services that we cannot see out in the open. But if you think about it, there's plenty of opportunity out there. I have a couple of questions. Uh, Please. First, uh, can we have a bacon coust? <laughs> The second, second one. Second. The second one. <laughs> uh, do you plan for a healthier version of Al Bake? Well, okay. Now we're starting with the very tough questions. Uh, Kaust. We came to Kaust and studied the uh, market here about a year ago or more. And we found that it's not feasible to open inside Kaust. So the next solution was to look out in the vicinity where we can serve cows, tool, and the highway. And we looked at locations that are accessible uh, so that we can serve the threes because we need a minimum number of population so that we can become profitable. The reason is we work with very small margins, so we've got to have the volume. If there is no volume, we start to lose money. We couldn't find any location on the highway. So what we did was a second best choice. We're going to be about 20 minutes away from Kaust. We're going to be on the checkpoint of Raheli. Okay. So at least we're coming closer. We're not there yet. Okay. <laughs> now, talking about the healthier version. Uh, if, by the way, if Kaus is ready to provide us a location where, can, where we can serve both the uh, community and Kaus, we look into it. Uh, the, even if we do a smaller express version, it doesn't have to be all the menu items, but some menu. Uh, when it comes to the health option, there is nothing called healthy food except if it's boiled or steamed. I don't like boiled food. <laughs> no, seriously. What I advise people is to live healthy. Enjoy El Bake once a week. I'm fine with that. I don't want your money more than once a week. Okay? <laughs> but please exercise. Please sleep well. Please don't smoke. Okay? There are excellent ways to live healthy and yet enjoy a little bit of, I don't know if I can say, uh, yeah, fried food. I was going to use another word, but I shouldn't. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, enjoy life, but be responsible about it, okay? Live a balanced life, all right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mohandas uh, Rami. Uh, this might be tough and a little controversial. Um, I've, I've worked at Burger King in high school in Valley Park, so I, uh, car parks and everything else, mop floors, so I understand where you're coming from. However, when I look at uh, all the restaurants of Al-Bake, the majority of the population working behind the counters is not from here. 
So as a social responsible leader to change culture, right, cleaning, cleaning closets, do you ever think that the people manning the counter would be majority salaries at one day? And if that's a good thing for your business and for the country? Thank you. Uh, excellent question. Uh, five years ago, if you tried to get one young Saudi to serve customers, they considered it a taboo. It's a cultural thing. They're worried that their friends and their uh, Gabila uh, tribe see them serving uh, customers. Today, this has changed. Today, we have uh, in the factories, for example, over 200 women, Saudi women, preparing the shrimps and the salads. We have over 350 young Saudi men working in the restaurants. They start uh, from the cashier side. Some of them have been managers of restaurants for the past five years and up. So the commitment is definitely there. And by the way, it's good business sense because I've noticed several times when a customer sees a young Saudi working, they help him in the service process. Uh, they are not aggressive with them. They, even if they make mistakes, they are there to support them. And you get bigger smiles on customers' faces when they see the Saudis working. So definitely it is a great business sense. We have a whole team that does nothing but recruit young Saudis, train them, provide them a career path, excellent training, and so on. We have challenges. For example, uh, one of our biggest competitors in keeping Saudis is the government, the army. As soon as they hear an army position is open, they all love to go there. I don't know why. But I cannot compete with probably higher salaries, better benefits, longer security uh, jobs, and so on. But the ones that we keep, they stay and they excel in what they do. So definitely it is our commitment to have Saudis. Again, when you employ Saudis, their families and extended families become proud. They go and tell stories about what they're learning, the English sessions and the computers that they're learning. And they're learning, they're getting certifications about, say, food and this and that. When they go and tell their families, they are doing the best, the word of mouth kind of will all trust what you tell them rather than see it on TV or out in the street. And we make sure that these Saudis are satisfied for them to go and talk to their families about our business. Yeah. Can we take one more question, please? One more. One more? Okay. Thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, I have a question. Is it true or a rumor that there is one real allocated for charity with each uh, baked meal? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will have to apologize for not answering such a question. But uh, let me just say a couple of words about this issue. It's not about how much money you give. It's where you give it and for what. It's not about just money. If you volunteer and you give some of your time to improve the way of life of others, that probably is 10 times better than giving one real from each meal. So let's stop thinking about how much money is going out to charity and let's start to ask what have we done to make life better for others. And again, it's not through money, it's through hard work and through sincerity from inside to make things better. Okay? Uh, by the way, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry I did not write, I'm 
accessible on Twitter. Uh, I can uh, provide you my uh, address. So anybody, I see a lot of questions. So please, you can uh, contact me through Twitter. Please, please. I am one of the customers for your product. According to you, every customer is valuable. Absolutely. So what I have observed, in, the, in your out, outlets, the queue rails are not provided. And only the people who are having muscle power wins and gets the items. <laughs> the old people like me have to wait and wait. <laughs> so uh, very, in McDonald's outlets, I found that these arrangements are available. Could you make uh, your, in your place also this improvement? Uh, for gain the customer's uh, satisfaction? This is, this is an amazing question. Thank you very much. Uh, if you allow me just to uh, take a couple of minutes, uh, you're absolutely right. This is one of the challenges we have. The system of service that we came up with like 20 years ago, which is by numbers, and uh, calling numbers, and you have... Uh, uh, come and present your ticket when the number is called. Today is invalid. It doesn't work. Why? Because our restaurants are oversaturated and people love for some reason, even if they're 50 numbers back, they love to stand at the counter and block the way. And I appreciate that. I mean, this is, okay, it's part of our life. Yeah. So, but at the same time, people, in our country, they hate to stand in line. You come and tell me, I'm gonna stand in line for 10 minutes to be served. I'm gonna get so frustrated and stressed. So, the positive part of the way we do it is that you're free for a good time of your visit to stand back, talk to your friends, go and sit in the car with your family until your turn has come. The challenge is fighting your way in. <laughs> Whereas the other option is to stand in line. Now, if anybody in Kaust can work with us to really come up with a unique crowd management system, they're more than welcome. We'll take them right away. And this could be another opportunity for business. Okay? But definitely you are absolutely right. <laughs> And now, please allow me to lend the mic to Ms. Maridor. She is the organizer for the web. Thank you. So, under the behalf of the web oh. <laughs> committee, please. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. I hope it was of benefit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Engineer Rami Borzala, and we hope to see you, inshallah, in the near future, inshallah. very soon. Thank you. It's an honor.